Welcome to the DevReady Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better tech. Today, we're fortunate enough to be joined by David Hauser, who is the founder, uh, one of the founders of Silicon Beach, uh, a meetup community and startup ecosystem in Oz. Uh, been around startups for many, many years. I was involved in a startup 20 years ago, way back in Germany from his homeland. You'll notice a bit of an accent, accent as we speak to David, but uh, David, thank you for joining us. and. Welcome to the DevReady Podcast. Um, it's my pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me, Andrew Anthony. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to have you on. Tell us a bit about you, how you got involved into startups, and a bit about your background from Germany coming to Oz. Yeah, sure. Look, um, startups, My, all, I go all the way back to high school with startups. Um, when I when I was in high school before I graduated, my teachers and my friends told me that that's uh, so, uh, what I'm supposed to do. But then so, somehow social pressure forced me into taking the safe route, becoming an engineer. Apparently, that's the safe thing to do in Germany. Um, and um, yeah, I, I dived a little bit into the startup world through my through my studies. I've worked in a in a startup that did exoskeletons for body motion capturing all the way back then 25 years ago um did some some equipment for the first matrix movie actually um with them and uh, unfortunately uh there was a ip dispute with another company in france which forced us out of the business uh, and then i went into my first accelerator while i was in cologne studying over there um, again, had an idea for, for basically the first variables long before there was Apple and, and smartphones. I was thinking about, uh, harvesting the, the energy that we all produce with our bodies to recharge batteries. Um, again, uh, was listened to the wrong people, took the safe route and, uh, dived into a startup that was, uh, putting up, um, wind turbines back then. Uh, but, Definitely not highly scalable, proper investment, but not a highly scalable tech uh, startup, right? Mm -hmm. Agree. The Matrix movie, which that would be would have been a fascinating thing. That was quite a big movie back in the day. It, it was a big movie. So, yeah, they just got our equipment. Uh, so I never met Keanu or anyone of the of the directors, but uh, it's quite, quite cool to know that at least a little, tiny little bit part of it was with us. You mentioned something around a, an IP issue. Now, we're all about sharing challenges around startups. If you're looking to dive in a little bit around that, because I've never heard of a business that closed down because of an IP challenge. So I'd love to dig in a little bit as to what happened there. Yeah, look, there were about in, in Europe back then, there were three players uh, in, the, in the body motion capturing and face tracking space. And I came into the startup when the product was developed and in the market, uh, replacing the, the original uh, designer and developer of the, of the physical hardware. And then suddenly a French company, a French startup said, Hey, by the way, we have uh, two or three patents uh, the, uh, on how you build your exoskeleton. And we, we identified it's pretty much a, a good copy of what we're doing. So stop doing that. And uh, that was about 80% of the business. And yeah, well, okay. um, at some point we had to stop selling those exoskeletons and we were left behind with 20% 20, 20 of the products, which were nice. So I've developed a data cloth, which were uh, sensing the, the finger motion, but that alone uh, was not enough to, to actually sustain the business. Fascinating, yeah, challenge that you had there because never heard of a challenge like that, but I imagine patents and bits like this could impact businesses. So something to be aware of when we're developing new technologies is to have a bit of a look around and see what others are also doing and how might we protect some of the stuff that we're doing as well. Did it happen without realising the patent what existed by the founders or did they think they had made sufficient changes? Or you can't say... <laughs> Look, I can only I can only resound what the founders told me, and uh, they did not do enough of their due diligence and just uh, trusted their developer. And that developer uh, very was very aware of what he was doing. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, interesting challenges when we go down this space into the new tech. But yeah, fascinating problem. I haven't heard of that before. But maybe let's look at our IP <laughs> and get an understanding of are we doing something different or are we infringing? So bit of a bit of a red flag there. Um, yeah, I just sort of dig into that because I found that fascinating. Then the wind turbine piece. 
you obviously um, had some con- concepts around wearables and you were probably correct. <laughs> we are all wearing some sort of tracking devices, or a lot of us are these days. Mostly taking a bit of a spin into the fitness realm is where mostly the wearables are sitting. Um, the the direct-to-consumer wearables are still very early days in terms of yeah, Google tried to put a glass out there that didn't really go anywhere. Um, the actually um, 3D sort of, sort of lens views, they, they've done okay. So they, I think they've done quite well, but for more in a gaming space. What were you thinking when you were looking at that area? Uh, we were managed that that was the mm-hmm. early days of, um, of mobile phones. I would mm-hmm. say it was the early days of mobile phones. Mm-hmm. And... My battery did not last long enough, and uh, we were just yes. thinking about uh, taking some of the learnings that we did with the with the exoskeletons into uh, devices uh, that are actually harvesting the movement, right? Putting mm-hmm. piezo elements in shoes um, mm-hmm. and uh, in uh, long joints, and instead of measuring the motion, just uh, harvesting the energy that is coming out of that uh, mm-hmm. motion. Um, which there are some tech startups around the world that are quite quite successful with developments in that space right now, but they moved away from having the the harvesting features on the body and putting it into the surfaces more. Um, in, there are installations in Singapore um, in uh, along footpaths where they harvest the, the energy of the people walking on it. And there, is, there are installations in Brazil on soccer fields where they basically do the lighting of the soccer field just from the energy of the players that are running around on the field. Oh, well, wow. They're fascinating. I've we seen had, some... Yeah, we'll yeah. See, we had an idea for a long, long time ago, um, a mouse that had the automatic watch winder inside of it as an idea to so, sort of self-charge based on movements. Hmm. But it's probably very different technology to what... I don't know if you're using sensors and things, it's very different to that. I'm surprised I haven't seen more of that sort of technology coming around to try and harvest the movements. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of waste that we produce just by by being around. If, if we would harvest the, the heat that we uh, that our heads produce, our brains produce, that that's a large energy source. Yeah, I can probably heat up my own house with the heat I produce. <laughs> so, getting into the the wind turbine space, so you went you went looking at how we might harvest energy. There are some really interesting stuff. I can't remember the location, but there's a train station. It might be somewhere in the UK that's put on as we go through the um, turnstiles and trigger it. It's actually capturing the energy rather than just a door opening and closing. Um, yeah, so there's different pe- people starting to implement these sort of things. Fascinating little area because we do waste and we don't consider this from a technology standpoint. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, there's a... There's a lot of look when when you look at a at a petrol vehicle, um, somewhere in the re, in the range of twenty to twenty five percent of the of the energy that is in the fuel gets actually transi- uh, transformed into motion. Right, the rest is waste. Yeah, just goes out the back. <laughs> yeah, it's not very good, is it? No, we've got a lot of learning to do there. In terms of um, jumping into Silicon Beach a bit more now. How did you get from Germany to Australia? What's that story? Because obviously you've been in Australia for a little while. Um, tell us a bit about the history of going from Germany to Australia. Yeah, sure. Um, look, at some point, uh, finally, I I finished my studies in mechatronics, mechanical design in Germany, got into the machine tool industry, very niche market um, around high-precision grinding machines uh, for motor gearbox components, but also for... Um, aerospace uh, gas turbines and uh, the smart uh, device industry very niche market and at some point I decided that I want to get um, a little bit out of Europe and there was this this one competitor of ours who was not based in Germany or Switzerland um, but here in, in Melbourne Australia and somehow they they got the word and they headhunted me to bring me to Australia it was in 2010 2011 and yeah, that's how I came to Australia, very comfortably oh, with a company supporting the whole transition. That helps that's a good a way to do it. <laughs> Brilliant. So obviously you were working in that space for a little while, but you've always had a drawback to startups and Silicon Beach came around probably, what, five, six, seven years ago. Um, what sparked that interest in going back into startups and generating a bit of community around it? Being more innovative. When Whenever, look, uh, I don't know if you have corporate or... Um, 
similar experiences, but large organizations struggle with, with being innovative uh, in the same way, right? There are structures, there are a lot of politics are happening, and it was just not as, as dynamic uh, as I would have liked it to be, and um, got more and more frustrated with that situation. And at some point, it, it was better for both sides to actually split up and uh, go their own ways. And um, after some traveling, um, I started to explore the, the startup ecosystem, uh, went to different events. And so after two or three months, I've, I've stumbled into Silicon Beach pitch night um, at, at a pub in the city and uh, was really blown away what a friendly community, supportive community it was. And um, was the first time in the, in the ecosystem that I didn't have the feeling that someone tries to sell me something that I didn't even know that I don't need it. <laughs> Brilliant. That's a good feeling, that one. <laughs> <laughs> so Silicon Beach. Um, so you're there, you got exposed to it, and you're obviously a big part of it now. Um, what's the journey been like being around that community and, and being a, a, really a part of it right now? Bumpy ride, a lot of emotions. Um, so I, I, I like the community. I did my own agency around design thinking, innovation strategies, human centered design, but always was drawn back to Silicon Beach, um, supporting people, organizing events, running pitch nights, doing some, uh, lunch and learn sessions, uh, for the community. Also used it as a, as a playground for my own startup ideas. Um, I think since, um, since I joined Silicon Beach, I'm now at startup idea number six. Um, roughly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and got involved with the leadership team. We did an incorporation in 2018 around, um, did not work well for us. And I was basically out of the door and said, okay, that's it. We're no way forward for us. And, uh, then this COVID thing happened. Um, everything got a little bit, a little bit disrupted and it happened that, uh, Attila who was back in charge, uh, back then, who grew the community here in Melbourne from 1,200 to 12,000 members um, in, uh, during his tenure, um, had to make the, the hard decision to, to let it go. And um, I was the one who picked it up, inherited the, most of it. Um, the, the meetup groups uh, in Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, Darwin, uh, the LinkedIn community, the Facebook group, uh, most of the IP, and then I had to figure out what to do with it. Obviously, COVID would have impacted it, considering it was all about meetup groups, connecting in the community. What sort of changed since then through COVID? Yeah, like most people, we had to go online, which uh, was which was a, a positive effect for us, a positive situation for us, because uh, being uh, limited to Melbourne before, we only had access to the Melbourne community. We, we learned from our networks that the... The old schoolers in Brisbane were really uh, looking forward to get us back. And once we went online with the events, suddenly people, not just from all around Australia, uh, but even from all around the world, were uh, coming to our events, pitching uh, at our pitch nights and uh, joining our educational programs. So that was quite exciting. So it actually gave you a bit of opportunity to expand the network out rather than shrink it down. But You didn't have to stop during COVID, which is probably the... Or how that helped grow because everyone had a place to meet online, I'm guessing. Yeah, look, and, and especially in the beginning when people were really scared um, about this lockdown situation and uh, not being connected to people anymore, the, the, the online events exploded, right? Uh, two months earlier, if you would have set up an online event, you yeah. would have gotten five people. Everyone else would have been somewhere in a pub. And uh, Correct. <laughs> then, then COVID comes along and uh, you have to upgrade your Zoom account because you do not have enough spots left anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a crazy world we stepped into back in yeah, that period where everything was online. We were all looking for how we connect. I remember um, sitting at home in meeting after meeting. I think everyone did this or Zoom after Zoom or team after team or Google Meets, whatever it was, but just felt like you were on a call all the time. And it became, all right, we need to slow down a little bit and just reflect on what's working, what's not. Since COVID and the opening up, have you gone back to more physical events? Are you mixing them together? Or what seems to be the model that's working for you? We are mixing them together, but uh, most of our events right now are online. Our monthly uh, entry-level pitch events where everyone can come and pitch for the first time in their life, they, we keep them online because um, we also understand it's not just the, the people in the 
in the big cities like Sydney, Melbourne, and and Brisbane that are in desperate need for startup support uh, are the people in rural Australia as well, and um, we we want to keep supporting them. Um, a lot of educational events uh, staying online and only the next level up pitch events uh, where we take the best from the community in front of accelerator operators and investors. We do those uh, predominantly uh, in person. In terms of um, Silicon Beach, has, the, the, has anything changed or is it still about support for the community? What's the, what's the why behind it? What drives you to keep going at this community? What keeps us going, it's the people, right? Not just the community, but also the volunteers. Uh, they are supporting uh, what we're doing. Um, what changed back then in, in 2008 when, when they founded uh, Silicon Beach, the, the original gangsters back in Sydney, um, it was all about uh, bringing the Silicon Valley tech spirit to Australia. Um, I think Australia did catch up to, to that trend quite well in the meantime. Uh, so we were looking into what what is our niche out there, how we, can we have a unique selling point for the community. And through the, through the years, we discovered that a lot of our members were a lot about purpose. Um, it's not just about money anymore. It's about uh, making a difference in the world, positive impact. And uh, that's when at one of our board meetings, we figured out, Hey, there is there is a gap in the Australian ecosystem that there is no community yet supporting uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, that's what we rebranded ourselves to uh, in 2022. It was and I said, okay, um, let's let's align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals and focus specifically on startups and founders that are interested in uh, working on those. Now, there are a number of those, I think it started at 11, correct if I'm wrong, and there's about 17, 18, could be a little bit more, I'm not quite sure, the number of voices is, is, is incrementally increasing. Uh, if someone wants to, to, someone's got a concept or an idea and looking to engage with Silicon Beach, you mentioned this on the phone, um, it doesn't have to be all about world peace. For example, um, there are a lot of sustainable goals that you might be able to align to. Could you just give us some examples of how people have thought about this within their businesses? Yeah, sure. Look, um, yeah, sustainability is much more than just uh, green energy and decarbonization. As, as you said, there are 17 SDGs uh, and they cover basically all aspects of human life or life on, on Earth. So we have the nature uh, topics. Um, but we also education uh, is an important topic. So any ed tech startup uh, will definitely meet uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, financial literacy, um, in, when we look at uh, the poorer part of the world population, there is a lot of uh, uh, things that can be done in, in that space. So fintech is working uh, as a uh, sustainable development goal as well. So we're working with startups right now that are working on um, blockchain solutions to make startup investment accessible for anyone anywhere in the world from as little as $10 a month. Um, and that's definitely aligned with the sustainable development goals, right? How does that work when you've got a cap table of someone that's investing $10, <laughs> for example? <laughs> what does that look like? How's the model there? I find that fascinating. No, that's probably something that we're still working together on, on figuring that out. Um, yes. yeah. Look, it's a, it's it's basically a crowdfunding model. Um, Got it. Crowdfunding, yeah. you, you do have a lot of people investing as well. Um, now, the problem with the current crowdfunding uh, situation is that you're in, but you can't, as an investor, can't make decision when you get out, right? And uh, that's one of the problems uh, that Wondao um, aims to solve. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. So there's a lot of opportunity for people to explore this, especially around their startups and how they might be able to benefit from a UN goal perspective. Mm. In terms of Silicon Beach, obviously you started out trying to bring tech from Silicon Valley to Oz, make it a, a bit more accessible to everyone. Is it about sustainability? That's the direction that you're driving. That's the pr predominant driver right now for Silicon Beach, but all about community supporting startups. If I'm a startup out there and have never engaged in a community like yours, got a concept or an idea, 
what's what do you think the starting point is for these these groups that are out there that maybe they're the main experts in a certain space they really got some concept that they want to drive for but have no idea how to attack it what would you recommend in terms of where to start join silicon beach and talk to us um <laughs> look, we, that. We, we, we we do not have all the answers uh, and we, we do not uh, pretend to uh, we openly say if we do not have a clue what we're talking about, um, but we, we then find the right people. So that that's well, that was one of the, of the things that really got me caught with Silicon Beach, that people did really give good advice who to talk to, made warm, warm introductions. And that's something that, that I'm missing a little bit uh, here in the ecosystem, the warm introduction feature. It's important, right? So I think going cold, not sure where to go. Sometimes you might have a conversation with someone in a network or somebody you just met that says, oh, you could use this in this area and you haven't even thought about that. Um, so it does really help to connect and communicate with others, get some feedback, understand where you're sort of driving it. When we talk to a lot of founders, some of them obviously can, well, not for obvious reasons, but they're concerned about their concept being stolen, ideas being stolen, taken by somebody else. What would you say to that? Because it is about community and sharing. How do you approach that conversation with them? Move fast um, and, and focus on the future. As soon as you uh, get scared that your idea gets uh, stolen, you're basically covering your back and you're not progressing anymore. And if you're not progressing, someone else moves faster. Because if your idea is a good idea, there are about 100 other people around the world who are having the same idea. And they, they are probably moving faster than you are better in execution because they're just focusing on getting it done rather than protecting their IP. Yep. Because, yeah, I would 100% agree with that. Just something for people to think about because the reality reality is you're not going to be the only one with the same concept at the same time. Um, like you said, there's probably a hundred people out there that have got the same idea concepts that are bubbling around and who's going to be the best executor and you don't have to be the number one in this world. Um, it's a big world out there, a lot of opportunity and um, yeah, a lot of market if you play it right in your right space. Maybe just tapping into the Oz market stage one is enough um, for a big enough business and to make a big enough difference in the space. So yeah, really good feedback and, and the ideas there. You're, you mentioned a couple of times through the call that you've been playing around different startup ideas and concepts um, and always been sort of love the space around innovation and how you might drive new change in, the, in, in an industry, a, in a, in a world economy, whatever that might look like. What are you currently up to now? Because personally, I know you're doing a few things. Uh, yeah, uh, a big focus is on uh, supporting the connection in between universities, industry and startups. I think there is a lot of potential uh, left to uncover here in Australia. Um, it's like different silos that are the, the, the occupants, the inhabitants of those silos do not talk with each other. And it's it's a shame. Uh, we could be much more innovative and have much more deep tech, especially in Australia, if we if we would uh, work closer together. So that's what we're working closely together with uh, RMIT, Swinburne, and Monash University. And um, then one of my of my pet peeves, and that's what I my my current startup. I'm I'm got sick and tired of the middle of the bell curve uh, approach. Um, over the last hundred years, from the early stages of, of mechanical designs to tech, we were figuring out how we can serve um, the middle of the bell curve and force people to, to basically like our technology. And I think it's about the right time with the technology is out there, AI, that we finally develop technology that is adjusting to the user rather than the other way around. What do you mean by that? I mean that uh, if you and I are using the same app that my user interface looks completely different to your user interface because I'm a different person, I have a different learning style. I probably, if we talk a physical app on a smartphone, I probably use my phone differently. I hold it differently. So um, the, the buttons and all the features are on the wrong side. I'm a more of a visual uh, learner, so I want to have more graphics. Another person wants to read more text. Uh, so far, the developers and the product owners decide what it is, one or the other. And uh, I'm a big believer that the future is in AI-powered customization of the user interface for each and every individual user. That's like a hyper-personalized experience for everyone. Yes. It's an inter interesting idea. Never thought of that. It's a, it's a fascinating thing. And we talk about personalization of different areas. But yeah, if we can drive it down into 
an app that we're working with or whatever it might be. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Mm. Could be quite a bit of opportunity in that space. And like you said, AI is quite powerful now. Um, we're doing a little bit in our world in terms of how we help people design and think about product. And um, it's fascinating what's possible. Uh, yeah, it's um, there could be some synergies in terms of what we're doing there. So I think we'll chat a bit more, maybe off, off uh, podcast. But yeah, let's talk a bit more about what you're up to because there could be some opportunity there. Cool. Sounds good. What are some of the sort of like key learnings you've you've taken across your journey from moving over with that corporate and then going into the um, Silicon Beach and everything that you've taken into what you're trying to approach now? It's good to know the theory, but it does not get you uh, to the to the holy grail. <laughs> okay. Um, often people who who, who know the theory uh, not as well um, are executing better than the ones who who know all the ins and outs and especially all the things that can go wrong. Um, and we see that we see that a lot in in the ecosystem. Not not every good teacher is a good is is a good founder or vice versa, right? And the same applies in in all other disciplines as well. Sports. Not every not every superstar is a good coach, and not every coach can be a superstar on 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 the playground, right? So that is that's quite interesting discovery. Yep, I can understand how. So if you have yeah, if you've understand everything you might be having limitations you understand what limitations have come before and maybe using those to prevent you from moving forward or if you don't know the theory is in, in as much detail you've got less things potentially holding you back very true yeah and look the the, the more structured the the we all get conditioned over time right and I'm, I'm coming from the corporate world i'm coming from the engineering world in in germany where we're very sophisticated in structures and processes and follow the rules um, which is not necessarily the mindset that really gets you gets you there in the, in the startup world. So a lot of reprogramming does have to happen uh, to let go of those old beliefs, what worked in in the corporate world, in that old world, and uh, learning to be more scrappy and uh, not not aiming for perfection twenty four seven. If you aim for perfection, you're uh, a long way off because it's all about just getting something out there, producing a concept showing more people getting feedback and evolving. I think the idea we start with generally is not the idea we end up on. Um, the reality is we may come in from the front of, all right, this is how we might approach it. What's the execution of it? This is how we might approach it. And then we'll learn that um, there are different angles of stakeholders we could impact that could make a bigger difference or uh, based on user feedback, there's a complete wrong angle. So there's plenty of learning there, but you need to be willing to test and fail fast, like I think you said in the earlier conversation, because if you're aiming for perfection, you're not really working with your users enough and getting more feedback. I feel like that's an issue people hold on to. Their product, their concept, work on it for 12 months, 18 months, and by the time they get to the end of it, they've got perfection in their mind, but not in anybody else's, and that's a problem. It is. You see it a lot in the space. It is, and, and we, we, we have... We have to understand, or it helps us to to be aware of it, that if people were not happy with the first iteration, but one year down the track they have a product that they're happy with, they they they, they don't mind uh, the the journey, right? One once the 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 goal is achieved, right? Um, yeah. So we we will not we will not leave a bad flavor behind just uh, by not being perfect from the get go. Yep. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Yeah, and you bring people on a journey, they actually buy in more. Where are we going? What are we trying to do? If they're helping you design or think about solution um, or even have some input and understand that you're listening, then you go and implement some of that input. They become advocates for the product. <laughs> it's quite interesting how that can flip quite pretty quickly. You might have someone that has no interest in what you're doing, but they might see, well, there might be a flavor opportunity there, and you start to work with them, dig it out, um, and all of a sudden, they can become really good users for you um, and really advocates for your, of your solution. So don't be shy to share is one thing I would leave people with. And, and that's your, your best marketing tool, right? You have yeah. you have convicted customers that are really uh, mm. waving your flag left, right and center. Yes. Go for it. Mm. No, no better, no better investment in marketing than that. 100% agree. Right. So if anyone wants to learn about Silicon Beach has never been exposed, what's your upcoming event schedule look like for people to check out? Um, yeah, just tomorrow we have a, we have a pitch uh, deck review masterclass. It's a new concept that we're 
uh, launching because we've, we've understood that going to a pitch night uh, and doing a pitch is nice, but people are not digging into the, the the perfect design of your pitch deck, right? So a lot of founders are getting stuck sending out pitch deck after pitch deck after pitch deck to never get a reply from any investor uh, and don't learn why it's not working. So tomorrow we actually have six or seven founders um, presenting their pitch decks and we have four active investors from Australia, Asia and North America that are actually going for the pitch and saying, okay, this slide, does, that's what's missing, that's too much. Uh, tidy it up and really giving actionable advice uh, to those founders. It's helpful because if you're just flicking out a pitch deck left, right and center and you're not getting any conversations, there's no learning happening either. I think mm. you can learn a lot by having a conversation with an investor and it's, yeah, there's a lot of importance to doing that and I think people need to be open to trying to push in to get those conversations because there is a lot of feedback that can happen in that. Um, as we work on a bit of a startup in our world, it's where can we get feedback from users, investors, anyone in between that's going to help you portray the message in the way you're trying to get it across to? Because sometimes as founders, we may be thinking um, in a different light where if you spun it in a different way or considered it in a different fashion, it changes the whole potential business model, the way you might operate this thing and the use case where we your product and it's still the same product, but because you give us yourself time to pivot and evolve, there's a lot of learning in that. Yes. Oh, brilliant. Mm -hmm. But we'll share out the details about Silicon Beach and uh, for everyone that's listening so they can get access. But David, thank you um, for joining us on the Ready podcast today. It's been a pleasure getting to know you, learning a bit more about what you're up to. And uh, sounds like uh, someone you want to connect to if you're a part of the startup community or if you're looking to enter into the startup community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Anderson. Absolute pleasure. Great chat. Yeah. Thanks, David. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Cheers, mate.